human actions are in fact driving species extinction uh, at about 1,000 times the natural background rate of extinction in the planet. 1,000 times, think about that. This is massive, it is irreversible. Uh, it raises all kinds of profound ethical issues. Uh, there's economic issues, it goes on and on. Uh, our speaker is the Doris Duke Chair of Conservation at Duke University. He is a world leader in the study of present day extinctions and what can be done to prevent them. So let's get started. Please welcome Stuart Pym. Well, good evening, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you tonight. When Al Gore, in An Inconvenient Truth, talks about extinctions being a thousand times faster than they should be, you might wonder uh, from where he got that, or from whom he got that, uh, and the simple answer is, uh, from me. <laughs> it would have been nice if you'd have said so, but you know, in this world, you take whatever publicity you can get. It comes from following the fates of birds and mammals and amphibians and reptiles and fish and, and sort of calculating a death rate for species in much the same way that you calculate a death rate for human beings. We know, you know that we are supposed to live um, you know, three score years and ten or rather better now um, and you can do the same thing with species and we are knocking them off much faster than that. The story so far is that extinction rates are increasing, they are irreversible, they are geographically concentrated, and tropical deforestation is the main driver of species extinctions. What we're doing to the world's forests is not to exploit them sustainably. They are shrinking year by year. Not only do forests hold the world's biodiversity, they hold the world's peoples too. If you look at the diversity of languages, we speak about six and a half thousand languages. How many of those languages are likely to be taught to children? The answer is about 600. We're going to lose 90% of the world's cultural diversity uh, within the next few decades. Uh, these two friends of mine are Warani, who made first contact in their lifetimes uh, when their homes were rudely interrupted by people who were exploiting oil. Um, and if you look at the diversity of languages, you see that linguistic diversity, cultural diversity, is now pretty much uh, concentrated in the tropical moist forests of the world too. As we destroy those forests, we are also harming our own species, our own cultural heritage. So one way of visualizing that is to look at South America and look at where its two rainforests are. There's the Amazon, the Mato Grosso. Um, and then there is a much less known, but equally important, maybe even more important forest, the Mata Atlantica, the coastal forests of Brazil. Originally, um, these were areas of 5 million and 1 million square kilometers, respectively. Uh, the map on the right shows what little forest remains and how much of what forest remains is close to an edge. It's close to a fragment. It's not intact forest in the sense that you can walk for mile upon mile upon mile in the forest but you are always close to a road, a city, uh, an edge, a, a farm, field, and so on. You notice that that area of coastal Brazil has very, very little forest indeed. That's going to be an important part of my story. The number of species of birds and mammals and amphibians we can now map out with some considerable detail. These are birds, and they show that the greatest numbers of species 
are in the tropical moist forests of the world, a pattern that covers all the continents. The interesting and unusual aspect, however, is when we begin to look at species in terms of their geographical range sizes, look at the species that have smaller than the median range. Those distributions are profoundly different. They are concentrated in special places, what my colleague Norma Myers calls hotspots. You will notice that this projection of the world did not include Massachusetts. That's because, to a first approximation, you actually don't have any biodiversity here. <laughs> um, so let's look at where small range species are. Why small ranges? If you have a small range, it's easier to drive that species to extinction than if you have a big one. So for mammals, if you look at the map of where the threatened species are, where the experts think that species are at risk of extinction, they map out pretty closely to the areas that have concentrations of small range species. About 90% of the world's threatened species are characterized by having small geographical ranges. Now, there are some famous species that are threatened and have big ranges. Lions, obviously. You know, as Dorothy says in The Wizard of Oz, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Those species conflict with us, and that's why they're threatened. I don't have time to tell you the work that I do with National Geographic's Big Cats Initiative on wildlife conflict, so I'm just going to concentrate on the majority, the 90% the of species that occur in these special places with small geographical ranges. Why should we care about saving biodiversity? Well, it's what we call the three E's, ethics, aesthetics, and economics. And yes, I can spell. You know, ethics, um, the Gospel of St. John says, God so loved the cosmos, at least in the original. Um, and we all know what follows, well, Christians know what follows next. There's an ethical compunction for us to, to care about biodiversity. As the Pope said in his encyclical this year, we have no right to destroy it. Aesthetics, you know, I watched The Wizard of Oz for the first time as a parent. Um, since Wizard of Oz wasn't terribly popular in Britain when I was young. Um, I watched it with my small daughters. And when Dorothy says lions and tigers and bears, you know, who would want to tell our children uh, that they're not wild things out anymore? And economics, quite simply, because biodiversity matters. When we destroy the places that house species, we are destroying wonderful places, the, 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 the important um, services that um, that biodiversity provides. So, good reasons for being concerned about this loss. So what can we do about it? Well, I want to look as an example on the coastal forests of Brazil. If you look at where threatened species concentrate in the Americas, it's the northern Andes and the coastal forests of Brazil. It's because there are lots and lots of species of birds, amphibians at the top right, mammals at the bottom right, that have small ranges, easy to destroy. If you look at the satellite image, if you look at the remote sensing, you can see why. You know, in the middle of that, um, of that image is uh, Guanabara Bay, famous for being a, a desperately polluted place, an awful place if you're an Olympic athlete. Um, but if you um, look at the rest of that image, it's fairly clear that a great deal of the forest has already been destroyed. In fact, as you zoom in on it, it's sort of worse than that. If you color code the forest, you notice that a lot of that forest is in very small pieces, very small fragments. What I've done there, doing here, is to take out the fragments that are smaller than 100 hectares, 200 acres. That's what it looks like, a landscape with lots of little pieces of forest. It's what Gombe and Jane Goodall's site is beginning to look like um, in Africa. 
what we know from the remarkable study done by Tom Lovejoy um, that experimentally cut forest islands into the forest as a, as a farm, a fazenda was being uh, established, is places like that lose their species quickly. Small fragments lose species, and they, the smaller the fragment, the faster they lose them. Fragmentation is very bad. You still have forest, but you don't have viable populations within it. So we can map out where the species are. When we do that, we get some very, very detailed predictions of where the greatest concentrations of threatened species are. This is for birds, but as we'll see, it applies to many other species too. These areas, the one shown in red and yellow, are the front line of saving species from extinction in the Americas. If we want to understand why there are so many threatened species here, one can look at the remote sensing. This is a landscape that is extraordinarily fragmented. These patches of forest, tiny and isolated, contain the largest number of threatened species in the Americas. The obvious question is what we can do about this. When faced with these images, I felt that everything we know about the loss of biodiversity from fragments suggests that the most effective conservation action would be to reconnect those fragments. As we close in on this image, the quality of the grazing land here is all too obvious. You can see the brown lateritic soils shining through. This is extremely bad land. Bad land, of course, means that it's cheap to purchase. It can grow carbon cheaper than it can grow cattle. The need to reconnect these patches is not just limited to birds. The area on the right is Hebio Yunyao, a nature reserve. And it's the home to the golden lion tamarin, a charismatic little monkey. So what do we do? We plant trees. And since we're cheap, we use child labor. <laughs> we have not just merely destroyed so much of the world's tropical forests. What we have left behind is in tatters, in fragments. And those fragments are often too small for species to maintain viable populations. There just aren't enough males to go around for the females and females to go around for the males. And of all the places, of all the fragments, one that I thought was particularly tragic was the one immediately behind me. This is the Union Biological Reserve in coastal Brazil, about 100 miles east of the city of Rio de Janeiro. Because in this isolated patch of forest are a whole load of species on the brink of extinction, the most charismatic of which is a beautiful little monkey called the golden lion tamarind. And the golden lion tamarinds in that fragment could not go forth and multiply into the forest uh, over there because there was the cattle pasture behind me. And when I saw that cattle pasture for the first time about eight years ago, a cattle pasture just like the one I'm standing in, I thought it has to go. And so we have made it go away. This is a restored forest. I helped raise money for my friends at the Asociação Mica Leão Dourado, the Golden Lion Tamarind Association. I've planted this forest and it now connects that once isolated fragment of forest in the Union Biological Reserve to a much larger area of forest over in this direction. It's what we call a biological corridor. 
and it means that the golden line tamarins that were once imprisoned in this forest island, this forest fragment behind me, can now cross through these small but growing trees and go and find new habitats, new homes, new places for their, for their tamarind families. So if you look at this area as it was eight years ago, uh, you can see an extremely degraded hillside, massively overgrazed by, by cows that were quite literally starving to death. The grazing was so bad. Uh, fast forward um, uh, six years, it looks like that. Um, I will be in that spot in three days' time, and I'll have an updated picture. You can see this from space. If you look at Google Earth, that's what it looked like eight years ago, and that's what it looks like now. Thank you. People often ask me, how on earth do you get up in the morning? You know, I'm the guy that Al Gore quote saying species are going extinct a thousand times faster than they should be. The reality is I get up in the morning because there's an awful lot we can do. We can prevent species from going extinct. Uh, we can be creative. We can use the good science um, to, to work out where we need to act and what we need to do. I'm proud to be the president of organization, it includes Ed Wilson, who used to be at Harvard, but as I'm afraid to your shame, is now at Duke University. Um, Tom Lovejoy, Peter Raven, Missouri Botanic Garden, Pat Wright, the primatologist, Trevor Price. And we understand that by being smart, by being clever, um, by doing good science, we can prevent this loss of biodiversity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Pim. Before you get away, is there, um, can we build enough corridors to save some species um, en masse? I mean, that's a, that's a great story, by the way. Congratulations. Thank you. you know, that's kind of nice to, to have that direct link to a, a save, as it were. But so, is since, this something that can we mass produce this somehow? Since, since I have a little bit to, of, of time to answer a question, I usually end my talk by doing my imitation uh, of a preacher and saying, children, you are living in sin. Uh, you are miserable sinners, and I can absolve you of sin. Uh, by selling you carbon um, indulgences. Um, for $70 a year, I can absolve your carbon sin. <laughs> and the answer is, yeah. I mean, I'm going to Brazil on Saturday um, to look at a whole bunch of other places. We're doing projects in Colombia. We're doing projects in, uh, in Ecuador and Madagascar and Indonesia. Um, it's a solution. It's not the only solution. We need to be stopping deforestation. Oh, but you know, there's an awful lot of things we can do, and I am entirely upbeat about our ability to do them. Thank you. All right. Thank you.